We kick off uh, the Celtic way this Sunday, and it's going to be our theme for the whole year. And if you don't know what a Celt is, nor do you know why it's important to know the way of one, the good news is we're going to cover that in today's sermon, but it's going to be just an introduction. The Celts are our ancestors in the Reformed faith, and the way that they understood Christ is really, really important for those of us who seek to live in the ways of Christ here and now. This morning we're going to turn uh, to 1 Kings. Uh, We're going to turn to the 8th chapter, 22nd verse, verses 22 through 28, and this is recounting King Solomon on the day of dedication of the temple. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands to heaven. And he said, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and steadfast love for your servants who walk before you with all their heart. The covenant that you kept for your servant, my father David, as you declared to him, you promised with your mouth and have this day fulfilled with your hand. Therefore, O Lord, God of Israel, keep For your servant, my father David, that which you promised him, saying, There shall never fail you a successor before me to sit on the throne of Israel. If only your children look to their way, to walk before me as you have walked before me. Therefore, O God of Israel, let your word be confirmed, which you promised to your servant, my father David. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Even heaven and the, and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I have built. Regard your servant's prayer and his plea, O Lord my God, heeding the cry and the prayer that your servant prays to you today. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Awaken us, O God. Awaken us to your spirit that hovers here. Your spirit that hovers here in this sanctuary, just as she hovered over the waters of creation, reach across the ages and breathe new life into these ancient words, that they would be your word, to us here and your word to us right now. And breathe new life, O God, into the words of my mouth and into the meditations of all of our hearts that all would be acceptable and pleasing to you, O God. For you are our rock and you are our redeemer. For we pray in Christ's holy name. Amen. When I was growing up as a kid, I learned that there were certain rules that applied to the sanctuary of First Presbyterian Church, Aiken, South Carolina. Like most lessons in my life, I learned this the hard way. As a kid, I found creative ways to pass time during the sermon moment. For instance, I would take my uh, bulletin and I would fold it into a paper airplane. I didn't know you weren't supposed to fly said airplane once you made it. I would play uh, tic-tac-toe against myself, which meant I was always a winner. (laughs) And I would cheer, celebrating the game that I had just won. When my parents uh, signed me up to be an acolyte, little did I know that my creative expressions would be on full display. Uh, The sanctuary at First Church Aiken is created in the round. The acolyte always sits on the front pew of the sanctuary where they can be seen by everyone. I, during the sermon moment, looked over at the candelabra of the seven candles I had just lit moments before and thought, if I had a water gun, I bet I could take out every one of those flames. (laughs) 
So I pulled out my water gun. <laughs> and for everyone to see, I took out all seven flames. <laughs> Sarah, I topped it off with one of these. Should have known then I'd end up in Texas. <laughs> My parents were thrilled. <laughs> Uh, the whole car ride home to my Nana's, my grandparents' house, for Sunday lunch was filled with all the rules I had broken in the sanctuary. There was, turns out, a way to behave in the sanctuary and a way not to behave. And I knew how not to behave, but I needed to learn how to behave you know, we all carry a set of rules with us. Every single one of us carry a set of rules that we were taught about what behavior is allowed in this sanctuary and what is not. You may not know it, but just ask your children. Because you've taught those rules to them. And I asked some of our children this week what those rules were. One of them said uh, right here in Preston Hollow Presbyterian School Chapel, uh, one of them said, there's no running allowed in this space. Another uh, shot up their hand and said, you're not allowed to talk too loudly in here. Another young person said, I'm not allowed to talk when someone else is talking up there. One of my favorites was uh, one young person as they were walking out, they said, uh, you're not allowed to have coffee in here. <laughs> I said, is that right? How do you know? They said, there's a sign right out there. <laughs> I said, well, I hope at least your parents let you finish it before you come in. <laughs> the truth of the matter is we carry these rules, these rules that we acknowledge or maybe have gone unnoticed with us into this space because we believe deep down that sanctuaries, they're spaces that are set apart. They are literally spaces that are unlike any other space that we inhabit during our week. At their best, sanctuaries and temples and chapels are places that are created, that are formed to awaken us to the presence of God and the sanctuary that is found there in every season of our lives. At their best, that's what a sanctuary and a chapel does. It awakens us to the presence of God in the sanctuary that we find in that presence in every season of our lives. It's why when we enter these spaces, we have uh, rules that have been handed down because we believe surely God is in this place. Surely God is in this place. Because there are a lot of days in our lives and in the world where we just aren't sure that God is anywhere to be found. But tell me God is here. Because when I'm here, that's what I most need. But we, sort, we sometimes get that mixed up. And we think, well, if God is in this place, then I have to, well behave here. I mean, if God is surely in this place, God is watching everything I do and everything I say. But I mean, when I step outside of here and I go home or I go to work, I mean, I might catch God on a nap, you know? God doesn't, he, God, she, she may not, he may not see everything I do which is silly. We know it's silly. 
Because we all know deep down in our bones that God isn't contained to just one place or one people or one time. We know deep in our bones that there's nowhere that we can go where God is not, and yet we play by a set of rules in here. King Solomon uh, knew that there was no place that we could go where God was not. Um, King Solomon even knew that after he built the temple in Jerusalem. Um, It was a temple that was so intricately constructed that there are chapters upon chapters in 1 Kings that outline the building materials, the plans for that temple, and how the building and construction actually went. It was a temple that took uh, somewhere between seven and eight years to build. It was a temple that required 10,000 people alone just to harvest the wood needed. Uh, Estimated 70,000 people were needed to get the stone and to get those stones just in place. You know, you could spend so much of your time and energy and resources in building such an impressive building that it might cause you to step back and only see a building (laughs) and everything you've done. Though King Solomon uh, was not just a ruler, uh, King Solomon was not just a developer, King Solomon was not just a builder, King Solomon was grounded in wisdom, which means he was able to see beyond what was merely visible and see what was true that's what wisdom is is to be able to see beyond what is visible so that one might see what is true or as the celts would say um, king solomon was able to see the invisible in the visible world So Solomon's wisdom um, was made known on that temple dedication day. Can you imagine after nearly eight years of construction, can you imagine after the amount of money that it took to get all of those supplies there and the tens of thousands of lives that were invested to build this space? Can you imagine on the day of dedication when they have sacrificed so many animals that they just stopped counting how many they had sacrificed? Can you imagine on that day in that moment that the king, Solomon, stepped to the microphone and said, everything we've built will never fulfill the purpose. This temple will no, will never contain the divine. This temple cannot contain you, O oh God, for the universe is as big as you are. God, you're just too big for this uh, little temple we built. But thanks for coming, grab some cookies, and stay around for the ribbon cutting. <laughs> Solomon, in his wisdom, is saying, God is so big. God is so big that the whole thing is a temple. The whole thing is a temple. The Celts, um, like Solomon, they believe that the whole thing was a temple. The Celts uh, believed that God was made visible through all of creation. The Celts, um, they were the northern neighbors of uh, the ancient Greeks and ancient Romans. They were known as Keltoi, K-E-L-T-O-I, which literally translated means strangers or hidden ones. They were known as the people who were strangers or hidden ones because they were uh, the people who dwelled beyond the places where the empires reached. They were the people so far out of town that maybe they played by a different set of rules. Keltoi is derived from that word kilt, C-E-I-L-T, which literally is translated as an act of of concealing. It's where we get the uh, 
word kilt. Because a kilt is a way of actively concealing something. You're welcome. (laughs) Dave Adams in his book, uh, Borderlands, he states that the Celts, they were able to do what we often struggle to do in the church today. The Celts were able to see the invisible presence of God in the visible and known world. For the Celts, the physical world was the hiding place of the spiritual. Or to put it as uh, the psalmists do, the earth is the Lord's in all that is in it. For the Celts, Christ was present in and through all things. And thus, the whole world was a temple. And how the Celts lived was an expression of their faith, for they were never not in the temple. There wasn't a set of rules that applied in one sphere of their life that didn't apply in all spheres of their life. To the Celts, um, how you parented was an expression of your faith. How you were at school, you know, like how you were and how you spoke to your friends was an expression of your faith. Who you were at the office and how you showed up, not just to do a job, but who you embodied yourself to be was an expression of faith. Because for the Celts, everything was holy. Everything was holy. You know, um, I've been your pastor long enough to know that I know that you want to believe this to be true. In fact, I know that most of you believe this to be true, but the question that you most wrestle with is, can I trust it to be true? You ask this because you know what it's like to get in the left-hand lane on the tollway and just gun it for all it's worth and to look up 30 years down the line and go, I don't know, whew, that was a ride. I've been your pastor long enough to know that um, death has a way of illuminating what we often miss in life. I've been your pastor long enough to know that you do sense that your life is holy, that the ground that you stand on is sacred. But can you trust it to be true? A couple weeks ago, we had our annual session retreat. We were over in Jubilee Hall. In the middle of the session retreat, I got up and left. I left um, to go over to my office to get this robe. I put on a white stole, and I drove to Sparkman Hillcrest, where I was to officiate an inurnment. I arrived. I walked in. I said hello to the family. We were uh, standing around chatting, but I had that sense sort of in my belly that it was about time for us to start. And so I went over... um, to the widow, to the husband of the deceased. And I said, is it time to begin? And without even thinking about it, uh, the widow reached into his pocket and he pulled out his phone and uh, he tapped the screen, you know, to wake up the phone. And I could see, I was standing right there, that when he tapped the phone, an image of his beloved, a photo of his wife, was his wallpaper. And I could watch it on his face. He looked at that screen and I could tell that he was transported to a place that was not where we were standing. He could see in that photo that that wasn't a picture of his beloved, but he was transported back to the moment in which that photo was taken. He was standing in that moment as he stood there with me. He could see that that was holy ground then. The invisible became visible for him. And then he looked at me. He came back from that time and he looked at me and he said, yeah, it's 11 o'clock, we should start. 
death has a way of awakening what we often miss in this life. We can often miss that the whole thing is a temple and that we're standing on holy ground. You know this to be true. The question is, will you trust it? I would encourage you uh, this afternoon, pull out your phone. Uh, Tap photos, hit the bottom left, hit all photos, and then get sort of aggressive and give it a good, long, big swipe. Let your eyes sort of go cross, you know, because you have all those images going at one time. And then just randomly, whenever it feels right, just go. And stick your finger on your phone. Stop it. And let whatever photo come up that you've just tapped. And take a look at it. It'll be a plate of food that you took a picture of, you know. And at the time, you thought you were taking a picture of a plate of food. But this afternoon, you're going to look and you're going to go, that's when all my college friends were in town. I didn't know 15 minutes later, so-and-so was going to tell us they were going through a divorce. God, I had no idea. Six months later, we'd be uh, burying so-and-so's mom. It'll be a photo with a bunch of boxes, you know. You thought you were taking a picture of moving day, you know, at college. You thought you were taking a picture of all the stuff you had to load into a car, you know. And you'll see it right there. I didn't know I was like trying to pack up my heart and get it settled into a dorm room. I don't know, it might be a photo of that first date and you'll look and go, man, I was a mess. I can't believe it took me three hours to get ready. Now we're married. Like a hundred thousand moments have happened since that photo. I don't know, it might be um, that picture from Easter. Easter. In the moment, all you could uh, think about was, why is mom making us stand in this heat? I'm hungry. I'm uncomfortable. And why do we always have to take this picture in front of this flower in the courtyard, you know? You didn't know then that was going to be the last photo you ever had with your mom, you know? arm wrapped around her shoulder. The whole thing is a temple. The whole thing is a temple. There is no place that you can go where God is not. The question is can you see that invisible truth made visible in your everyday life. I close with the story of those kids who were playing behind the kirk one day. Kirk, that uh, Scottish word we have for church. They sound like a bunch of me and my knucklehead friends, and they were roughhousing, and one thing led to another, and one of the little boys picked up a rock and threw it, and it slipped out of their hand, and it went right through that stained glass window. And they all hit, held their breath, thinking, oh, we're in trouble now. Sure enough, the minister walks out, looks at them, and goes, and they walk right into that kirk. minister sits them down right there uh, in a pew of the transept and says, I want you, I want you gentlemen to look at uh, that stained glass window and that rock that you threw through the window. Turns out uh, that rock went right through the bottom of a stained glass window, that said, glory to God in the highest. For whatever reason, that rock went right through the E in the. And the window now read, glory to God in the high street. 
So the minister looked at those boys and said, I want to thank you because you've just made this window more faithful. We're not going to fix it because this window now says what we actually believe. Glory to God in the high street. Please stop throwing rocks. <laughs> Glory to God in the high street because the whole thing is a temple. May it be so.